A very good morning to you all and a warm and special Rich West Epiphany welcome to you if this is your first time joining us on this platform. Please feel free to join in and be a part of God's family. would like to know more about you and do life together with you. Here at the Epiphany, we are all about the three E's, encouraging one another, equipping one another, and engaging in missions both locally and abroad. So please do get in touch with us. We are a welcoming faith community. I hope you've had a good and reasonable week, or maybe call it a month, or maybe it has been a bit of a challenging one. I'm sure it's been slightly better than the month of April. In life, I believe there's always room for improvement. Always good to take time to reflect on how the year is traveling, lest we find ourselves in December and think, oh wow, how did we even get here? Well, whatever week or month you have had, Today marks the beginning of a new week and an end of the month of May. But most importantly, in our church, in our church calendar today, it also marks the end of the Easter season. The 50 days that run from Jesus' resurrection to Pentecost. And they are marked in a particular way by the presence of the Holy Spirit. In John chapter 20 verse 22, When the risen Christ first appeared to his disciples, he said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. I was thinking to myself, how amazing that Jesus did not condemn the disciples for having denied and abandoned him during his passion, but instead granted them the spirit of forgiveness. The Holy Spirit is actually the first gift of the risen Lord to the disciples and is given above all for the forgiveness of sins. And today being the day of Pentecost, God sent the Holy Spirit upon the apostles and this is where we see the birth of the church, the glue that holds us together. It's almost like the cement that binds the bricks of the house. Despite everything that may be going on around us today, we are reminded that the Holy Spirit lives in us and he lives among us to preserve our communities, to preserve our faith community, to preserve our families with love and with unity. A few weeks ago, we celebrated Mother's Day. And today is also a reminder that as God is our father, the church is our mother, our choice of family, An open and welcoming home where the manifold joy of the Holy Spirit is shared. Today in the history of the church marks the day the Holy Spirit made the apostles a new people and created in the apostles a new heart. May we also today receive a transformation of the heart. The Holy Spirit is the fire of love burning in our church and in our hearts. And as St. Paul says, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there there is freedom. My brothers and sisters, after we have heard his word today and received his Holy Spirit today and any other day, let us not harden our hearts, but let us go out there and be like the burning bush of the Holy Spirit as we spread the love of God around. Jehovah Shammah. God the Omnipresent is here. God the Holy Spirit is here. And he wants to bless you. Let us pray. Spirit of God, you dwell in our hearts and in the heart of the church, guiding and shaping our diversity. Rain down on us today. Like water, we need you to live and to survive in the world that we live in. Come down upon us anew. Send us your fire, the Holy Ghost fire, and teach us to love one another anew, just as you love us. Renew our hearts and teach us to forgive as you forgave us. We ask for a heart that feels that the church is our mother and our home, an open and welcoming home where the manifold joy of the Holy Spirit is shared. Heal and comfort all those that today are physically, mentally, and socially unwell. Lord, meet them at their point of need. 
Bless the worship team as they lead us in worship this morning. Bless Joel as he brings your word to us this morning. May we worship you in spirit and in truth. Be present with us here as we begin our worship, that we may be filled with the Holy Spirit today and forever. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let's join the worship team as they lead us in songs of everlasting praise.
Welcome to our Kids Time story today and I want you to imagine that this is a person. These two bottles are people. I'm going to call this one John and Betty. That's what we used to have when I was growing up, John and Betty books. And so this is John and Betty. Now the problem is that if you look at John and Betty you'll notice something about them. They are empty and John was feeling that was something missing in his life. There's an emptiness and he was thinking, how can I fill that emptiness in my life? And so there's lots of things that John would like to fill his life with. And he thought, hmm, uh, maybe a house, maybe a brand new car, maybe a big screen television, perhaps it's a holiday overseas. And so John wanted all these things. And I want you to pretend that this egg are all the things that John wants. We might even call it the golden egg. And so these are the things that John wants. But the problem is, it doesn't quite fit into his life. You can see like I can try and make it go down but it doesn't quite go down. He'll use the pointy end it just doesn't quite fit and, and so John tried all these different ways to get all these things in life he wanted. You know he, he tried, he twisted and he turned, he worked hard, he tried different angles to get all these things that he wanted in life and the problem is when we try and do all these things on our own often it fails and yet God tells us if we seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all these things we want will be added unto us as well. But when we do it in our own strength and we try and strive and make them our priority, things often go wrong. And so if we try and push this egg in, if we try and force it in, oh, ugh, it's, ugh, it's, oh, yes, look at them. And we're going to, it's, oh, goodness. Yep. There we are. Put up all the broken pieces here. And yes, we've got, there it is. We've got all those things in our life. And we're filling up our life with these things, but often there's a sense of brokenness as a result. And I'm going to need a cloth just to wipe my hands now after that. There's a brokenness that comes as a result. We've got the things we want, but it doesn't really fill us the way we expect. On the other hand, if we trust in God and we seek first his righteousness, these things come to us. And at Pentecost, and we're celebrating Pentecost Sunday today, we read something amazing happened. While the disciples were gathered together in a room, the Holy Spirit came upon them. And girls and boys, you might be able to remember how the Holy Spirit manifested himself. There was something that appeared like tongues or flames of fire that sat above each and every one of the disciples. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And as we're filled with the Holy Spirit and the things of God, guess what? The things we want in life are added unto us as well. And so we can strive to get all the things of the world in our own strength. We might actually get them. But it can often be very broken and not quite the way we would like it to be. Or we can actually seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, knowing that if we do, all these things will be added unto us as well. And that's what was happening at Pentecost. As the disciples trusted in God, they were filled with the things that they really wanted in life. But girls and boys, if you remember the story of Pentecost, we read, that something like tongues of fire came and we saw that. But there was another presence of God too. Not only the speaking in tongues, but the disciples heard something like a strong wind blowing. Remember that part of the story? And it filled the room where they were. And I wonder if you can think about how we might be able to get this egg back out. Well, just like they were filled with the fire of the Holy Spirit and they received those things, so the filling of the Holy Spirit, the wind or the breath that filled them enabled them to go out and share what they had received with the rest of the world. And so we're going to create some wind and blow into this. And look at that. And so we can strive for these things in our own strength, but they can be a bit broken. 
or we can be filled with the Holy Spirit and God will give us those things. But not only will he give us the gifts and the things we want, but he'll give us the power of the Holy Spirit to share those gifts with the rest of the world and those around us. And so I pray for you and for your parents that this Pentecost Sunday, as we think about the coming of the Holy Spirit, we may celebrate the fact that if we seek first God and his kingdom and the things that are right before God, he will fill us with all the things we want in life and he will gift us with all the things we need to share his good news with the rest of the world. May you have a blessed Pentecost Sunday. And girls and boys, if you want to try this experiment, may I say, please make sure you do so under the supervision of your parents. Blessings. God has amazing plans for all of us. Let me tell you a little bit about my life's journey so far. I was born in Poland in 1969. Both my parents came from farming backgrounds. Their families were uh, resettled after World War II. They all came from the east of Poland and they got moved to the southwest. My mum worked in a travel agency and my dad got a PhD in botany and taught at the University of Wrocław. I'm one of two siblings. Uh, I'm the oldest. I have a younger brother. As a child, I went to the local government school and after school, I went to German classes for about six years and to English classes for about a year. I spent a lot of my childhood on my grandparents' farms, both of them, and spent a lot, lot of time with farm machinery and farm animals. In the 1970s, my dad went to study in the US and it's over there that he came to the conclusion that life in a communist regime was not a viable long-term proposition for his family. And at that time, he already made some tentative plans about migrating to the West. In 1980 and 1981, there was a lot of political strife in Poland. A new trade union called Solidarity uh, took up its fight against the communist government and there was lots of trouble brewing. My father refused to join the Communist Party and my mother was a trade union representative at her travel agency. So as you can imagine, they would have been uh, at the front of the queue for any political repercussions. In mid-1981, things were getting very heated up and my parents were worried about what might happen if the Soviet Union decides to treat Poland the same way that they treated countries like Czechoslovakia and Hungary in a couple of decades before this. So my family escaped Poland. We claimed to go for a holiday to Italy, but we never made it. And we turned up to a refugee camp in Vienna, in Austria, handed in our papers and awaited resettlement. We left everything behind. After about nine months of being posted around various parts of Austria and waiting our turn, we arrived in Melbourne, Australia in March 1982. After a few months, I found, found myself deposited into a Catholic school in Term 2, Year 7. I was the only Polish-speaking student in a sea of Australians, Italians, Maltese and Greeks. I had a lot of fun, but it was also very hard. I had to learn English very quickly. I've always loved reading books, which helped me to grasp the language and expand, the, and expand my vocabulary. My school was very good to me. My dad became frustrated with being unable to work in university and eventually retrained to become a high school teacher. And my mother worked in the plastics factory in Laverton. And it's in that factory that I got my first job, around the time I was in year 10. And pretty much for the following few years, Every holiday was spent packing bottles in the factory. Eventually I got promoted to general labourer, storeman and forklift driver. That was a lot of fun and I learned quite a lot of new skills. I finished year 12, which was the first year it was called VCE. Up until then it was called HSC. My parents pushed me very hard to study during my high school years. 
and um, I got as high, I got a VCE score that was high enough to get me entry to get me entry into University of Melbourne to study medicine. Although my first love was chemistry, and I thought I might choose that type of work. I don't know why the medicine door was open for me. I think God's hand was in it. There were no doctors in my family, um, and there was no particular reason why medicine might be a career choice for me. But I learned as a teenager to trust God in the difficult parts of my life, to not worry and put everything his ha in his hands, and in the end, it would turn out the way he planned, which was a good plan for me. In the second year of medicine, I met a wonderful lady, Elisa, who would later become my wife. When I lived in Poland, I never would have guessed that I would be going all the way across the world to live a new life and to meet my wife. After graduating medicine in 1993, I worked in St Vincent's Hospital in Melbourne and in a number of country hospitals across Victoria. Alyssa and I got married in 1994. We then began to study our postgraduate qualifications and this delayed the start of our family for a few years. Our first son Benjamin was born in 1998, our second son Jacob in the year 2000 and Reuben in 2006. I started a PhD in 2002 just as I was completing my cardiology training but by around 2006 it was clear that I couldn't continue it and I abandoned it due to family and job responsibilities. I worked in the public hospital system as one of the staff cardiologists at Western Health from 2002 to 2017. I now work part-time in the public system in the Alfred Hospital. I work across a range of private hospitals. I'm also a partner at HeartWest, the largest private cardiology practice in the west of Melbourne. I teach medical students at Notre Dame University in my rooms. I've been blessed with a wonderful job that allows a richness of human contact and plenty of opportunity to help my fellow man. And my first-hand experience as a migrant gives me that extra motivation and that uh, extra spice that uh, allows a different dimension to my interaction with patients. There's a lot of work at all hours and sometimes it can feel a little, a little overwhelming but a couple of things keep me grounded. My own family and my Epiphany family. I've been blessed with a wonderful wife who's a daily reminder of the power of human love and devotion. And it's a reflection of the even greater power of God's love and sacrifice for his children. I've been blessed with three children who are very different and they each need love and show love in different ways. As for my Epiphany family, I've been part of the congregation since 2003. I come from a Catholic background and it was a little step across to the Anglican tradition. It's this church family that has also helped to keep me grounded. No matter what happens during the week, one vital link to the greater truths and a greater purpose lies in my connection with my Epiphany family. The teaching, the praise and the fellowship have all been a rich blessing and I make every effort to join the family every Sunday. Over the years I've developed a few interests in music, performing arts, photography, audio and other technical things and all of these interests and skills have been put to good use in my Epiphany life. I have no idea what God's got in store for me for the foreseeable future but I trust in him because he's a good father and he has a good plan. Thank you all for listening. Today's Bible reading comes from the book of Acts chapter 2 verses 1 to 13. The Holy Spirit comes at Pentecost. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were, staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard 
the sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment, because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, Aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native languages? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they have had too much wine. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to Good morning, Epiphany. Let me pray. Lord, on this Pentecost Sunday, we thank you that the risen power of Christ lives in us. We thank you that this changes everything as we open up your word today. May it transform our hearts and our minds to know that your presence lives within us. May you speak to us today and may we go and live this for your praise and glory. In Jesus' name, Amen. Well, can you imagine the last few months during lockdown without worshipping, without online services like this? Can you imagine connecting with loved ones without Zoom or Skype or WhatsApp calls? Imagine your free time without YouTube, without Spotify, without Netflix. Imagine trying to do work without email or Google. Can you imagine going through the pandemic before this without the internet? I reckon our life in lockdown for better or for worse would be a completely different reality. Some of you may not remember this, but on August 6th in 1991, there was a defining moment that transformed the world. It was the day that the world wide web went live. It's when the internet happened. And as we go to our passage today in Acts 2, Pentecost was a defining moment for the church. So much more than the introduction of the internet, empowering God's people, his church to transform the world. As we look at the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 1, we see that Jesus had gloriously raised from the dead. He had risen, and he had appeared before many witnesses and his disciples. And Jesus was teaching his disciples about the kingdom of God and told them to wait in Jerusalem for a power through the Holy Spirit. And then we see in today's passage, in chapter 2, from verses 1 to 4. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. And suddenly, like a sound of a blowing of a violent wind, came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. And they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came and rest on each of them. And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. So friends, they were all together in one place. And the picture of this fire came and separated and rested on each of them. What is going on? Well, friends, this was a picture of God's presence coming on his people. The Holy Spirit being outpoured as promised to empower his church. See, in the Old Testament, God's presence was seen with his people as a pillar of fire. We see this in Exodus in the desert. In chapter 19, we have this remarkable scene at Mount Sinai where God's presence as fire descended on the mountain. Later, we see God's fire, his presence descend on the tabernacle. And in the life and ministry of Jesus, in his baptism, God's presence, his Holy Spirit descended on Jesus as a dove. And now we're in this room at Pentecost. And God's same fire, God's same temple presence, the presence from Christ, not only with us, but now in us. God doing a new thing, empowering his church. 
And see, Peter explains this in verses 17 to 21, that this was a defining moment for the church. It was a fulfillment from the prophecy from the book of Joel. See, in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit was only set apart for God's special leaders, like prophets and judges and kings. Also in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit was not permanent. It was for a particular purpose. Yet here, God is doing something new permanently, pouring out his Holy Spirit on all people. God's holy presence being poured out to anyone who believes in Jesus. And notice from the prophecy from Joel in verses 17 to 19, that the Holy Spirit doesn't discriminate. No matter age or gender or social status. Not just for the powerful, but also for the servants. And what happened in this room for every person who follows Jesus is now empowered God's own presence. And this changes everything. See, the book of Acts is describing the history of the church from this defining moment. Where the church is empowered by the Holy Spirit. To be on mission to the nations, empowered to boldly share Jesus, empowered to live in Jesus' new kingdom rule and open to God doing new things. The same Holy Spirit that raised Christ from the dead continues to empower God's people today, us, here in 2020 in the western suburbs of Melbourne and beyond. Point one, empowered for mission. See, this is happening during a Jewish festival, the festival of Pentecost. So what happened is all God-fearing Jews all descended on Jerusalem for this festival. People who were scattered across the nations all came home for this grain harvest festival. And in verses 5 to 12, Luke is drawing us to the nations being present at this gathering. In verses 5, it says, from every nation under heaven. See, friends, without aeroplanes or exploration, the the aboriginals from Australia, the native Indians from America, obviously weren't there on that day. However, looking at the places listed in verses 9 to 11, this was a comprehensive representation from east to west of the known Greco-Roman world. From all the places around the Mediterranean basin was represented. In verses 6 and 7, the Holy Spirit was poured out on this international and multilingual crowd. And they all heard and they all recognised their own language being spoken by people who had never learnt them. I don't know if you've learned English for the first time of you, or you learn another language and it's really hard. It has to be a supernatural work of God. No one learns a language in one moment. And the point of these tongues, the point of this supernatural provision of foreign languages was a defining sign of the church to reach the nations. See, the list of nations was a representation from Genesis 10. Here we see the Tower of Babel where people arrogantly believed they were like God. So God separated them. He confused their languages and separated the nations. But in this defining moment, we see God's gracious reversal of Babel. The church being empowered by the Spirit, overcoming racial and national and language barriers all gathered around Christ Jesus. And in verse 6 and 7, we see the crowd's response. They heard this, they were bewildered, and they were utterly amazed. Notice that their amazement is because the Galileans were speaking their language. See, in every age, there's snobbery. The Galileans were not exactly the educated type, and they were known for not even speaking their own language properly. So people judged them as uncultured, as being country bogans. But here they were speaking foreign languages from other parts of the world 
perfectly, without fault. In this defining moment, the Holy Spirit means God's presence was now for all. It wasn't just for one ethnic group. And we see that in the quote from verse 21, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. See, salvation wasn't just for Israel, but for the nations. And this defining moment was a dramatic shift amongst God's people from coming in to going out. See, the people of God, their mission in the Old Testament was largely to bring people in. Jewish converts would also follow the law. They would all come to their centralised city and their centralised temple, as we saw on this day, to worship God. Yet God's people were always called to mission. They were always called to be a blessing to the nations, but Israel failed in this call. Yet it would now be fulfilled through Christ's church. And at Pentecost, in this defining moment, we have a scene where God's exiled people, the 12 tribes of Israel, had come home. They were sitting there in a room filled with God's presence, no longer just for the temple, but inside of every believer in order to take it out to the world. And we see Jesus say this in chapter 1. In 1 verse 8, Jesus says, But you will receive the power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. Empowered to take Jesus' message where? To the ends of the earth. From the first gathering, the church was supernaturally empowered for mission to the nations. And we see this shift outward in chapter 8, where Philip encounters the Ethiopian eunuch, where he sees him trying to read Isaiah on the road and Philip helps him understand the scriptures and shows how it points to Christ Jesus, taking God's presence out to the world one person at a time. Likewise, in Acts 10, the Holy Spirit was so committed to the message of Jesus going out through angels and visions leading the Jewish Peter to go to Gentile um, Roman officer um, Cornelius's house. See, Jewish people didn't just pop past a Jewish person's, uh, sorry, a Jewish person didn't just pop past a Gentile person's house. And as Peter boldly shared about Jesus, the Holy Spirit was poured out onto the Gentiles and they were baptised on the spot. A pivotal moment in the church where the Holy Spirit was sending the church out to Antioch, to Cyprus, towards the end of the earth. And seeing the empowered church on mission should cause us to reflect about our walk with God. Is our faith predominantly an inward-focused faith or an outward-focused faith? How much of our life is about Jesus when other Christians are not around? How much of your faith reflects taking Jesus to the world or is it about going to church to escape the world? How many of our close friends, people that you invest in, people that you share your life with, are not Christian people? The Holy Spirit often calls us out of a Christian bubble to be loving and serving and boldly sharing our hope with non-believers as well. Who is the Holy Spirit calling you to pray for, to meet up with this week? See, we're a gathered church and also a scattered church. Church, but sometimes we like and get comfortable in the gathering. It's wonderful, but it shouldn't replace our mission out to the world where God has placed us. And our season through COVID 19 has taught us that our mission to the world, the Holy Spirit, is not limited even by us physically gathering together once a week. See, the reason we meet on a Sunday, the gathering, is ordered us to be equipped 
by uh, God's word and through his spirit to, in order to go out and be scattered again and take God's holy presence out to our neighbours and our friends and our universities and beyond. <laughs> I'm not saying we should prioritise evangelism over discipleship. In Acts, they perfectly go together. Yet the church overwhelmingly has a movement going out. That's why at this church, at Epiphany, we're committed to engage in mission here locally in the Hoppers Crossing and in Melbourne's West, yet also towards the nations. That's why in our services, we take seriously God's call for the nations to be gathered amongst us. And it's beautiful when we're meeting together. Yet we still have room to grow. There are people from the nations who live around us who do not yet know Christ. That's why we take seriously the call to take God's presence out to the nations and the various communities around us, like the Indian community and Tarnit and Traganina. So what does this mission look like? Well, point two, we're empowered to boldly share Jesus. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit meant people in verse 11 were declaring the wonders of God in a way that was understood by the people there. From this defining moment, we see empowered disciples boldly sharing Jesus. In Acts, we see this remarkable transformation of these disciples that were denying Christ at the cross, who abandoned him to boldly declaring that they have encountered the resurrected Jesus and they're willing to die for him. In Acts 1 8, Jesus says they will receive power. Why? To be his witnesses. I don't know if you've ever been to a witness to a crime, but the cops want to know the story. They want to know what happened. They want to know the facts of the situation. See, the Holy Spirit would empower the disciples to tell of their encounter with him. Sometimes we take the Holy Spirit as this mystical force that we don't know what to do with. As Jesus ascended to heaven, as we heard last week, the Holy Spirit, a person of the Godhead, with the same godness or divinity with the Father and the Son, is committed, amongst other things, to make Jesus known through us, the church. The word gospel means good news or message, something to be shared. God's presence in us empowers us to go out and boldly share Jesus. So often we hear sayings like, we're called to preach with our lives and only use words if necessary. Yes, our message with Jesus must be accompanied with transformed lives, a love that serves each other and the world. However, the church only exists today in Hopper's Crossing in 2020 because empowered disciples went out to the ends of the earth with a message. Ordinary pe people sharing the extraordinary news about the resurrected Jesus. Tim Keller quotes saying, The gospel is news that creates a life of love, but the life of love is not itself the gospel. Friends, the reality is that we live in a culture that loves what the church does for the community. They love that we serve the poor. They might even like our Jesus. They'll think he's a nice guy. But our society, some in our society, will have a harsh resistance against our message of repentance and salvation. See, sometimes we fear risking friendships, so we hold back. Like the disciples in Acts, our lives might not be on the line, but our message can cause us to be re resisted, mocked, ridiculed. You're, we're the weird Christians over in the corner. But friends, there's spiritual forces at work preventing us sharing the good news of Jesus. The cross and empty tomb is foolishness to those who are perishing, Paul says. 
And like a Pentecost, we have the nations in our midst. And while some may reject our message, many more are amazed and want to find out more. And because of this Pentecost day, we have been given a new power to boldly proclaim him faithfully, unashamedly, the risen Jesus. So where is your influence? Where are your key relationships, whether at work or visiting friends at the shops or dropping the kids off at school with other parents or with that friend down the road. Whether we feel it or like it or not, we bring the presence of the Most High God wherever we go. And we've been empowered to boldly share Christ more urgently than that latest Netflix show. 1 Peter 3.15 says, But in your hearts revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to anyone who asks you, give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. To boldly and clearly share the hope that we have. How? Well, in love, with gentleness and respect. And this was true in Peter's own life. Peter went from denying Christ three times to enact risking his life and boldly preaching the good news of Jesus. And what do we share? What is the gospel? Well, it's often described as a beautiful diamond. It is beautiful in simplicity, yet it is deep. And like a diamond, it is multifaceted. There is many beautiful elements to it. But can you share the gospel in a few minutes if your friend asks you? In Peter's speech here in Acts 2, just past our passage, there's some key elements that I just want to briefly highlight. First of all, the gospel is part of God's bigger story. The God wonderfully created this world, a good world. And the fall occurred when the first humans asserted independence from God. And sin and evil entered humanity and this world and God's wonderful gracious plan to do something about this to reconcile humanity back to himself and in Acts 2 we see Peter is speaking to the Jewish crowd and is showing God's bigger story he shows the message of Jesus is fulfillment of the Jewish faith that Jesus is the Messiah in the line of David the one who's come, who came to redeem his people. In verses 22 to 23, it contains sharing the message of Jesus' life and ministry and his death on a cross. The one who died on our, in our place for our sins. The one who shed his blood for you and for me. Highlighting both our guilt for this, but also this being part of God's larger saving Peter's message also focuses on the resurrection of Jesus. That Jesus physically raised to new life, from death to life. See, if Jesus wasn't raised from the dead, all of God's promises in Scripture, everything Jesus said was pointless. But in the resurrection, everything is yes and amen. And vindicates everything that Jesus said and everything that God had promised in the Old Testament. The gospel calls for our response. In verse 37, the crowd heard the news and were cut to the heart. They were saying, what shall we do? As they responded, as they encountered Christ. See, the Holy Spirit calls for repentance. To be changed, turning from a life of independence, living our own way, living a life of sin independently from God, to turning to living a life, obeying and trusting Him, receiving the wonderful gifts of forgiveness of sins, receiving the Holy Spirit, God's presence in us. And we're not just saved to wait around for heaven, but saved to be part of God's kingdom on earth, here and now. A new life of obedience and love. If you do not know God, if you do not follow Jesus today, turn to him. 
You know living your own way just doesn't work. It is a road to darkness and death. But look to him. Call on his name and be saved. Come to him with all your sin and all your mess. And he will give you all these wonderful gifts of new life. Of God's holy presence inside of you. A new life with him. For those of you who have been a Christian for many years, please know that we don't graduate or go beyond the gospel. As we grow in our faith, as we grow in maturity, the glory of Jesus' life and ministry and death and resurrection, our good gifts of forgiveness in him, a life full of the Holy Spirit, God's presence in us to live in his kingdom here on earth. May this increasingly be our joy and the centre of our lives. See, the gospel isn't just the ABCs of faith, but the A to Z of our faith. Point three, we're empowered to have kingdom priorities. In chapter two, immediately after we, they received the Holy Spirit, in verses 42 to 47, we see a whole new church community with kingdom priorities. We see a church here not only sharing about Jesus, but looking to know Jesus more and each other as well. They were committed to discipleship. They were devoted to the apostles' teaching. They were devoted to God's word. They were people of prayer, sharing their lives and meals together in each other's homes. As we consider our relationships, it's so easy just to share lives with people like us. In this world, we're encouraged to associate with people that give us value who will add to our reputations, who will add to us um, socially. People who are fun to be around. People who return the favour back to us. And often these people are the same from the same cultural background, the same type of job, the same life stage. Yet we see God's presence is displayed and God's kingdom is fli- uh, the, sorry, the kingdom of this world is flipped upside down. Where God's presence creates a whole new community with different ethnicities and people with different backgrounds, the rich and poor together, people with married people with kids and single people, all committed to sharing their lives together in Christ. In this new community, they are empowered not to only know Jesus more, but to live like Jesus as well. Not only spiritually, but physically as well. Sharing their lives, serving the poor with those who could not pay it back. In verse 45, those with money selling their possessions, providing for those in need. This is radical. And the early church was marked by this kingdom generosity, both individually, but also collectively, as a people, as they sold their possessions, as they made clothes for those who needed them, feeding the widows. In chapter 4, this was so profound that they even eliminated poverty in their midst. It said there wasn't a need in their presence. Rather than this individualistic mentality, the Holy Spirit empowered them to live in generosity and grace. God's supernatural presence was seen in this as he moved with healings. People raised from the dead and now are filled with awe and joy as they lived out God's kingdom priorities. And just a reflection on this. Kingdom of God priorities means we're open to God doing something new. On this day in Pentecost, there was two different responses to the work of the Holy Spirit. In verse 13, while some in the crowd mocked them and said that they were drunk, others in verses 7 and 12 were utterly amazed, asking, what does this mean? They saw that God was doing a new thing. Like with Peter at Cornelius' house, God was doing something new. See, Peter receiving these visions of all these animals that were now okay for them to eat. See, 
This was undoing a lifetime of understanding for Peter, a lifetime of understanding of the law, a lifetime of religious practices, not associating with certain people, yet he wonderfully uh, was moved and shared Jesus with them as he trusted God's kingdom priorities and boldly stepped outside of his comfort zone. The Holy Spirit enabled Peter to be adaptable to the new thing God was doing. And everything was going against his experience and his understanding. Yet because he was open to God's kingdom priorities, the church now was going out to Gentile outsiders. So we could think, oh, right now we're not even physically meeting in church services together due to COVID-19. But the Spirit often uses the worst situations to do something new. In chapter 8, we see Stephen was horrifically stoned to death. The, the Jesus followers were in despair. They had to leave Jerusalem in safety. They were scattered and persecuted. Yet the Holy Spirit used these horrible events while terrifying at the time to empower the church to a new thing expanding out the church to the ends of the earth. In chapter 2, the Holy Spirit empowered the church to not only grow in depth, but also in breadth. They were not a stagnant community. And from this moment at Pentecost, the Holy Spirit gave them a harvest, not of grain, but of 3,000 new believers. The church encountered God doing a new Thing. But in reality, this would have been hectic, this would have been messy, this would have been uncomfortable. Imagine the practical reality of being there, one of the disciples. The church met in each other's homes, sharing not only prayer, but God's word and meals and their possessions with many who were poor. So we might pray for revival, but when the Holy Spirit moves, it can come at a cost to our comforts and our preferences. Like Peter at Cornelius' house, everything we once knew was flipped on its head. It was messy and it was uncomfortable. Furthermore, Peter also experienced this internal opposition for other, from other religious people who did not like what the Holy Spirit was doing. For us, kingdom priorities means we're also open to God doing a new thing amongst us. Obviously, it has to be in line with God's word, but this might mean God's calling you to step out in a new way. We meet together in person soon, and that will be wonderful, but it means that God is calling some of us to step out of our comfort zones and take the risk of reaching out and joining one of our ministry teams, maybe on the welcome team or in the hospitality team or joining the worship team as we consider to expand services. Maybe it's taking a risk and deepening your relationship with God and other people by joining a life group or youth or young adults. Maybe it's accepting that church services are changing beyond our own preferences, but it's reaching a people that we're not reaching before. Maybe it's stepping out of our faith boldly and sharing your story and sharing the gospel of our Lord Jesus to that friend or that work colleague who have shown signs of interest in your faith. Maybe it's taking the courage to show that crazy generosity to that person that you know in our community who is really struggling right now. Kingdom priorities means also sharing our ministry. It means being open to giving other people an opportunity to serve in the way that we may have done so for years. Getting a light alongside others, equipping them in that ministry area. Or patiently journeying alongside that person struggling with that particular issue, loving and serving messy people, sinful people just like us. Change is difficult. And so for some of us, our personalities will love change. And change is not good just for change's sake, but 
in line with God's kingdom priorities. Let us be in step with what the Holy Spirit is doing. As we see in Acts 15, it involved the conservatives and the progressives, the Jews and the Gentiles getting together, nutting it out, working it out together from this defining moment at Pentecost. Empowering the church through the Holy Spirit, Jesus continues to write his story through his church through us today, writing his kingdom priorities on our hearts that we may be open to what the Holy Spirit is doing as he does a new thing amongst us and in us. Let us be boldly sharing the risen Jesus. Let us be on mission, taking God's presence out to our neighbours, our work friends, our communities, from Hopper's Crossing to Werribee, Tarnit and beyond. Let me pray. Lord, we thank you. That from this day, from this defining moment, your holy presence has been poured out on your church. We thank you that you don't only bring us to yourself, but you give us the power and the presence of yourself to live as your people in Christ Jesus. May we never take this as a light thing. May we take your wonderful, glorious, holy presence in the world with the reverence and awe that it deserves. And may people see our lives. May people hear the good news about you. And may they look to you and turn to you in faith. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you to acknowledge that you alone are the righteous, loving, all-powerful God. You alone have mercy on us and hear our prayers. We come today to bring our thanks and requests to you. We pray for all nations of the world during this pandemic. We ask that you would move all governments towards justice and truth and bring good governance to safeguard their citizens. Especially we pray for countries where numbers of deaths is very high and countries that have limited medical facilities. We ask your mercy and protection for the people and for their health workers. We pray for our nation and ask you, precious Lord, that you would give wisdom and humility to our leaders in federal, state and local government. Please guide them during this very difficult time of pandemic. May they make wise decisions to help all people who need assistance for work, jobs, finances and accommodation. Strengthen the Christian politicians to speak truth and act rightly. In your mercy, please contain this virus and restore us to one another. We pray for those who are sick with COVID-19. We ask that you would bring them back to health. We pray for those in our congregation who have health issues in body or mind or spirit. Heal and uplift them, and give them your peace that passes all understanding. We give thanks that you are the God who brings mercy and wholeness. You are our strength and refuge. Lord, we thank you for the safety and freedom we have in this country to meet and worship you freely, to sing and to pray. We remember and pray for our persecuted brothers and sisters in many countries where governments actively restrict free worship and place hardships on them. We ask that you would move the leaders of their countries to give freedom of worship to them. May they know that you are an ever-present help in trouble and that your presence, Holy Spirit, will sustain and encourage them. We pray for young and old in our church and in our community. We thank you for a partial return to school this week and we pray for others who will return to their classrooms next week. Father, in particular, we pray for the challenges of VCE with the students having had so little face-to-face time both uh, with each other and with their teachers. So would you please encourage and strengthen them as they return to the hard discipline of VCE. We thank you so much that children and youth have uh, hardly been 
touched by COVID-19 and so we pray that this may continue as they return to school. Thank you too, dear God, that so many older people are keeping in touch, whether by phone or Zoom or email. We pray that this may encourage each one. We pray that such communication will reduce the feelings of isolation which we're all experiencing at times. Father, we ask for a blessing and we ask for guidance for various leaders in our parish. We pray for Glenn and the ministry team as they continue your work in creative new ways. We pray for the parish council as they meet each month and as they plan in between. We pray for Edie and David, the church wardens, along with Glenn as they wrestle with the new church building and all the plans and responsibilities that go with that. We pray for the many women and men in our congregation who will keep in touch pastorally as much as possible with our wider church community. Bless those who have been entrusted with this task and bless those who will be reached out to. Father, we thank you for sending the Holy Spirit into the world and into our lives. We are grateful for our unity in the Holy Spirit. We are grateful for what he does for us in our church and so many others. We thank you, Father, that the nations of the world come together to praise you and Epiphany and other churches give witness to what you are doing. So we pray your blessing because you are the almighty, the only wise God. And we pray these things for your glory and in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.
again, it's been a real pleasure having you with us for our service of worship this morning. And I do pray sincerely that you have been encouraged by this service of worship. There's just one announcement I wish to draw your attention, and that is to again remind you of our weekday reflections that you can find on Monday, Wednesday and Friday at 12 noon. You can reach those either via the Epiphany Facebook page or via our website page. And as we conclude our service today, let us do so with a blessing. May God stir up within you the gift of the Holy Spirit, that you may confess Jesus Christ as Lord and proclaim the hope and the joy of the everlasting gospel. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and all whom you love now and evermore. Amen. May we, in the week that lies before us, continue to love and serve the Lord in the name of Christ. Amen.